All right, everybody, welcome back to episode two of Evans Imagines, talking about negative mass antimatter, um, starting with, as you can see, a little different format. I'm not just going to uh, get right in, into the PowerPoint at the suggestion of my wife. I will talk to you a little bit full screen so you can see me and hear kind of my enthusiasm and whatever about the topic. I should probably also give you a little personal intro, like how I came about thinking about stuff this crazy. Um, no, that's not what I did for a uh, dissertation. No, it wasn't even one of my proposals, uh, propositions or whatever for my PhD. Um, but I had the idea towards the end of getting my PhD. Uh, I was flying home for um, Christmas uh, one, I think it was, in 2014. And um, that's when I realized I was looking at the stars out of the window or something from the plane. And it's like, huh, how do I know that those particular stars are made of matter and not antimatter? Because you know, we'll get to it. This is the foundations of quantum mechanics lecture. And it, you know, it takes more than 30 minutes to talk about quantum mechanics. So it's only a little bit of it, but, um, but part of it is that the antimatter and matter versions of hydrogen and helium and all that have the exact same like absorption spectrum, exactly, not like approximately or whatever, but exactly the same. And so I was like, hmm, so we're getting all this light from far away and are just assuming that there it's the same it is here. And, you know, I had learned about the anthropic principle and stuff in class, and there were some people who were really against it at the time. And like, I didn't really like it because it's very, um, seems circular to argue that things have to be here for us to see them. Guth didn't seem to really like it. He was the guy who was teaching it to me, but I didn't have a strong opinion at the time. And the only way I've come to have a strong opinion is via this theory and how it leads us to make really wrong assumptions. It's like, when we assume that we have traveled a long way, long enough to sample the universe, we make an important assumption about the universe that isn't true. We haven't gone anywhere. Like in the grand scheme of things, I'll revisit this point a lot of times, but intergalactic, oh, that's too loud. Helicopters in LA. Uh, but intergalactic space, uh, it's like five, 10 megaparsecs in between galaxies, uh, sorry, clusters in between clusters between us and the nearest cluster is about 10. Normally it's about five or four on average in larger tracts of space. But why are there clusters, right? Why do we have a largest gravitational unit? There's a very big question here. And moreover, the question of, um, we ha haven't been there yet, right? Like that was what I was getting at is, I've, I've seen the light from far away. I've assumed it's like it is here but where have we been? So relative to this five megaparsec number, we've been 0.0000670s megaparsecs away with Voyager or whatever our first furthest mission is. So I think we need to be a lot more humble than the anthropic principle. And I think the way you do that is getting rid of it and getting rid of symmetry breaking at the same time. But we'll get to that in a second. And for now, I will figure out how to share screen. Uh, here it is. Share. Uh, that's not the screen I'm going to be sharing. Uh, I'll tab. I'll tab. New share. No, that's the one. I just don't see where it is. Uh, okay, so share. I am screen sharing. I'll tab. This is not good. Uh, I'll tab, maybe a control tab. Yeah. Hmm. This is definitely not the screen I need to be sharing. And I had it right up right before this. Oh, control. That's how I do it. Okay, so this is the screen I'm sharing that you all can see. All right, so I don't know how to edit this, so you will all get to see that very long transition. Also, I don't know how to present anymore. So unless this is presenter mode, in which case I'm sorry, but uh yeah so homework from last time if you guys remember this is i mentioned earlier this is our foundations of quantum mechanics class i also mentioned this is not an entire course on quantum mechanics i am teaching this the exact way that i want to and it's short and you'll need more than this to be saying you know quantum mechanics and doing more stuff with it than just understanding the point of this class so i told you to read through griffiths uh one through three and do problems that look interesting along the way i was revisiting this morning it's basically to get you used to looking at 
uh, bra and ket notation, getting used to thinking about probable, probability in quantum mechanics. And he, he calls these different positions things, the realist position, the orthodox position, the agnostic position. I don't know why he's breaking it into these weird categories. He should use things that other people say. So like positivist um, or completionist is what the realist is. He's being very, like by calling it realist, and then it's Einstein's interpretation. That's the thing that like, is it realism? I mean, you're about to go on in one of these other chapters and say that real variables have to be Hermitian. Well, Hermitian variables that don't commute don't meet Einstein's conditions. So I don't think he can be called realist, uh, but you know, these are, it's very interesting. I think it's worth diving into. Uh, make sure you've read it and have, have your own viewpoints on these, these issues. Um, Oh, the, but yeah, the, how probability fits in with quantum mechanics is interesting. Um, it's, I think it was good of him to point out the generalized statistical interpretation is kind of plus this middle ground orthodox position, which is really positivism. Like we just have what we observe and that's all we observe. And if you want more than that, you should observe something else. And if you can't or don't draw a lesson if you want. Uh, but anyway, all, I think it's important to recognize the degree to which statistical physics played a role as a precursor here. Uh, it's not really the point of this class, but um, there's a lot of stuff in chapter one about wave functions and the completion of wave functions, normalization of wave functions. It is just probability normalization, which is just the same thing from ensemble, like taking an ensemble average. So granted that's thermodynamic um, generally in terms of its setup, but uh, I think it's a pretty similar, this is some sort of uh, metaphor or allegory we could draw on usefully. But for this class, um, that's all we're gonna dwell on Griffiths. Uh, you can come back, I guess, I'm sorry, there's a little bit more harmonic oscillator. I think we'll come back and talk about uh, square well, these examples. You'll need to know because we assume they can be taken as um, examples of other things. So. Uh, like uh, similar cases. So harmonic oscillator in particular, you think like a spring or whatever it is, traditionally a pendulum without wind resistance or something. It'd be a weird case. And it's weird that it comes up so much in classical physics now, since we don't have clocks that have pendulums anymore or whatever. The reason it's coming up is that it's a very important quantum mechanical model. And um, so particularly like you remember uh, in chapter three, I think maybe two, the raising and lowering operator idea the idea of breaking um, the Hamiltonian into different operators that you can play with mathematically and that have cute little like uh, relationships that build into answers for eigenvalues. Um, I think that's that's pretty important. So like you can play with them if you know how to play with them. So I, I suggest learning how to play with those. Um, there's also these three different, okay, so I'll talk about it the way that I like to talk about it. The book, as I mentioned, had three different types about it, uh, a way to talk about it. Uh, I don't really like the way the book talks about it and begin as a divergence in our thinking more generally. Uh, and I mean, he's not going the same direction. He's trying to teach you everything that they learned. It's kind of a historical development. I have that point on the next slide. Um, but he does have the good point. The limit as Planck constant goes to zero of quantum mechanics is always supposed to recover the classical mechanical result because that's... Uh, yeah, where we get these equations from, and it's a perturbation. Um, then, yeah, I think realism is a really bad coin there because it's not realism. It's yeah, it's completionism. It's humanism. It's like we should know everythingism. Um, the EPR paradox is a. It's like why there are people who still think this is true, but I'm not one of them. And yeah. Uh, as I mentioned, this is historical introduction um, in the book, the way he goes about it, talking about waves, talking about um, probability and stuff. That's the way Schrodinger did it. That's the way it was done first. That's the way people have done it since then. It leads to a lot of confusion because um, not everybody's wave mechanics guys. We don't really teach a lot of wave mechanics early on to any of our physicists. So it's okay if it didn't help you right away. You don't have to learn it that way. There's a couple different interpretations, ways to think about it, and you can use whichever is useful at the time. They're all complementary. They're different philosophical interpretations. None of these three things has a different observed value. So, you know, take your pick. I don't care. You can be a positivist. You can be whatever as a philosophical person. So you could be a Copenhagen and Schrodinger person, someone who is 
uh, wave function collapse, statistical interpretation, um, all the possibilities exist up until you make the observation and you making the observation changes something fundamentally. It seems to me like there's a problem with how do you distinguish which you use make the observations and which are just there. Um, I think everything has to be an observation. So then I, I get, I'm more of a three guy in terms of my overall viewpoint about the world. I like a unitary wave function, never collapsing. I'm existing in many different worlds. It's like, if you like community, if you like Dan Harmon stuff, Rick and Morty, and the many worlds interpretation is just more fun. It's, and it also doesn't bias yourself towards the observer, right? I mean, I don't like the bias towards the observer. I like the idea that the observer himself is part of a fractured universe, even though he can't get out of his own universe. Um, but the Heisenberg interpretation, right. So Heisenberg and Schrodinger are two different ways to look at the time dependence mostly. Um, Heisenberg's pointing out that you can do all of the work on the operators and Schrodinger is pointing out you can do all of the work on the wave function. It's just two different ways to look at it. We'll talk about what it means in a second. Then we'll talk about path integrals a little bit. Uh, I already mentioned, don't like where Griffith's going next. There's a reason it's not like the book for the class. I just like the guy and I like the way he starts talking about quantum mechanics. But yeah, we're not gonna go into Klebsch Jordan. We don't need to show you all the cool other tricks you can do with these different um, oscillators and stuff now. Let's go from the Schrodinger equation right to the Dirac equation, which normally is introduced as relativistic but for our purposes is how he discovered antimatter. That's what we really care about. We're gonna also add some path integral discussion because um, Feynman liked it and we're gonna talk about Feynman a lot and gonna use Feynman lectures. So uh, to, to connect with him, we're gonna introduce path integrals. They're also a nicer way to think about certain things uh, such as the graviton, uh, negative mass energy, antimatter. Meh, that's a little overbroad. So yeah, this meant something to Schrodinger. I don't know if it means something to you, um, it might, if you're a big analysis guy and coming from deep math to, to see my videos, um, this is the equation for the Hamiltonian definition of Hamiltonian classical analysis. So it's not like this is a new equation. It's just that now we're applying the idea of a Hamiltonian to a probabilistic space via this wave function operator. You don't have to write it. In. This is kind of Schrodinger E. Yeah. Schrodinger's slide. Um, so yeah, all classical observables are related to their quantum mechanical operator. This is uh, uh, what you would expect uh, based on our thing about limits, right? Like if you have to take the limit and recover the other thing, well, they better be related. Um, but that's cool in terms of the operator expected integral, right? Because that's what you would expect. And um, yeah, true for long numbers, check out the homework if you wanna go um, get a little more in depth here and feel like you know quantum mechanics a little better than you do. Okay. Uh, but besides the relationship um, of quantum mechanical and classical variables, there's more, right? Like it's not just like, oh, okay, well, this is how they relate and there's an exact correspondence. It's not that you know the position and momentum and it's just a matter of like, they are a little different because of quantum. No, they're, the concept of them is different because of quantum. So um, we see something like this um, with a spread of X, spread of P, those aren't words. We need to talk about this, what they really are, which is the variance or I forget, um, standard deviation, right? I forgot the whole thing written here. Standard deviation, is the square root of the variance. So that's what we're really talking about here. The spread is the square, like this is on the right-hand side, it's an equality. So we have to talk about exactly what we're talking about. Um, so yeah, the variance is what's limited. The X square root, the, well, expectation value is limited to this. You can square it and call it the variance, whatever. Um, but, right, so there's a de Broglie wavelength even for log, large objects. Um, so you have quantum fuzziness, I have quantum fuzziness, but um, you're not gonna be in a quantum coherent state. You're not gonna be able to, it, the number of events that would have to happen simultaneously that are also quantum events become so many that it's not going to happen. So you're not going to feel your wave uh, motions. You're not going to have crazy energy levels or whatever. Um, you're not gonna get hit with light and jump or something. But uh, I mean, cause it would be a crazy wavelength of light that would be a weird energy. Um, but yeah, so there's a de Broglie wavelength. You can explore this more with your local um, Google machine. It's uh, a fun concept that practically doesn't really have any use. Um, oh, right, I'm, I'm introducing it though to talk about the different interpretations and the way to talk about uh, uncertainty principle in them. 
because this is the way you think about Schrodinger versus Heisenberg picture. Well, the way you talk about it is to say there is a, instead of spread and position and momentum, because that's talking about where you found the thing, which is talking about wave functions, you talk about a relationship between the operators. And in particular, they don't commute. So that's cool uh, that, that, that you can re, that the ideas of a spread and position and momentum and non-commuting operators are the same idea is important and interesting and not at all obvious to me, but maybe it was to you, fancy math guy. Uh, okay, so here's another, just a breakdown of how you view the world in two different interpretations. Heisenberg, Schrodinger, I'm giving, building up towards that Heisenberg is why we like to think about path integral methods. Um, Schrodinger is normally the way that we are introduced to it. We think about wave functions, wave functions changing over time. Um, and it's easier to connect to because we've been on the ocean and we know about waves or whatever. But uh, that's focusing on spatial variations. And as we've talked about, these aren't really, they're not there in all of those places at once. They're there wherever we measured them with various statistical probabilities is what we've been saying in the standard model. So I like the Heisenberg interpretation, which is that you have a propagator and it's propagating an initial state. It breaks apart the initial conditions and the time dependence. And um, yeah, you have a time generator. It's cute. Elegant math to be done. I like elegant math. I'm an elegant math guy. But they, like, like I said, these are just two different pictures. Do whichever is more convenient for you at the time. Uh, philosophy is not important to me. No offense. I, I mean, I like philosophy, but I like epistemology more, as you saw in the last lecture. Uh, yeah, kernel. This is the form of the Lagrangian that winds up describing the time dependence. So if you look at the kernel, um, you wind up with all of the time dependence is up here. Um, yeah. Okay. Boop. Uh, yeah, now we're going to go over a couple of examples because I talked about at the top how these would be important. Particle, particle in a box, that's Griffith's 2.1, infinite square well. Um, it was useful in quantum dots. I have this up because it was more useful in the past, but mostly it's just a simple model with easily understandable energy levels that corresponds to nothing, right? Because in real life, you don't got boxes. You got particles and, bo and particles in particular have like, you know, some sort of realistic potential between the realistic potentials in general are not wells. They are like, you know, curvy boys. And so since you got some sort of curvy boy, you're going to want the next model, which is the harmonic oscillator. So my apologies to the particle in the box and to people doing quantum dots and stuff. Still, it's fun and interesting. And I have stuff to talk to you about with fluorescence and uh, vibrational energy sapping fluorescence. I think that's what bleaching is, but it like causes electronic vibrational state changes. But this, what am I talking about? That's way off in the distance. Uh, we got to get on going to the next. I'm talking about curvy boys. I'm talking about the harmonic oscillator. That's the curvy potential. Um, it's a very important model. Like I talked about it, look, still, you just look up the Hermite polynomials and stuff when you're doing the question. Don't pretend like the math part of it is important. Nobody knows the Hermite polynomials except people, not, except really cool people who are probably watching this video. So I'll stop making fun of you guys. Uh, is the mass of the harmonic oscillator potential um, inertial or gravitational mass? It comes from Hooke's law. It is uh, inertial mass. Pretty much all of the masses are inertial masses except gravitational mass. It's uh, a little bit of a trick question, but hey, you're paying attention. Yeah, it's fun to get a question for you. Um, oh yeah, I meant to say it earlier. Like uh, share, subscribe. That was supposed to be part of the earlier part where I was talking to you guys, but I got so uh, wrapped up in my telling you about when I was on the plane. Okay, uh, raising and lowering operators. Yeah, we talked about this earlier. I was telling you it was important. It's mostly important conceptually because people like to work in the Heisenberg picture. They're going to like to do this trick with the operators and, and solve questions. I, I like to do it. You're going to see it in a couple of, you know, that's what we're going to do. There's also in the book, this is like right at the end of what we were assigned to read. If you read it, I want to give you, you know, a little bonus, give you this slide. The idea of the wave packet, path integral sampling. Um, these are cool. Um, you can revisit them in a standard class probably because they're way off on the side and we'd have to talk for like 15 minutes to get anything out of them. But just like you can think about something as a sum over states, you can think about it over time as a sum over states. So you have the idea of a wave packet spreading, all those states spreading over time. Um, you have the idea of a path integral sampling, different paths near near the optimal path. How do you optimize that? 
Um, but like I say, those are more for real quantum mechanics classes. So see you later. And on we go to the Dirac equation because I want to, because um, I want to connect to negative mass and antimatter because I'm directed. This isn't just a funzo introduction to quantum mechanics. No offense, there are a lot of those out there. And I think you guys have done a great job. You got it all covered. So go check those out. Google quantum mechanics and whatever part of this you didn't understand. Uh, uncertainty principle, Schrodinger interpretation, Heisenberg interpretation, a lot of good stuff. Thank you, Khan Academy, et cetera. A lot of people out there doing good video, but nobody on this. So now we're talking about the Dirac equation. Um, so it's our main reading for next time. I'm introducing it now mostly, and I'm showing you three different versions of it. Top one, we got eigenvalues. Bottom, we got relating related um, kind of, uh, what's the word? The operators that are part of it. So I would say do not focus on the matrices. Focus instead on the eigenvectors, because that's where I have anything to say that's useful and interesting. Uh, these ones are the ones that are traditionally interpreted are as weird because they have negative energy, negative something, something's wrong about them. Um, so yeah, think about these for next time. Think about how you solve this equation and think about how you interpret these answers. Is there anything more I need to tell you for next time? No, yeah, you can do a couple of the tricks we talked about if you want to. Uh, I'd recommend doing number one. It's a fun question. That's why I included it. Uh, if you got the book, go do it. Um, I like number two. It's a good intro. Uh, read the EPR paper, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. Um, it's called... Um, uh, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. You should look it up. It'll be fine. Um, it's also in the Griffiths afterward 12.1. So you can find that. Um, and it's important for setting up what we're going to discuss next time about, uh, maybe the time after that, I forget. And well, we talked about a little bit this time about why we uh, position in momentum and completeness. Is that a good argument? We're going to talk about that next time. So examine the Dirac, uh, equation, like we just started and particularly the Feynman Suckelberg interpretation of this. Um, so figure out uh, how it's currently interpreted, and maybe think about other possible interpretations. You can go read my paper if you want to. I have a very specific answer to this. And the last one is if you want to get good at path integral calculus and path integral quantum mechanics, you should go do this one, the perturbation theory on the kernel to the zeroth and first order. Convince yourself that that recovers the Schrodinger equation. I talked about earlier how the limit as h goes to zero recovers the um, classical mechanics thing from the quantum mechanics equation. And here is how we see very explicitly that the Schrodinger equation is a first order expansion of the kernel. So I think those are useful for that reason. That's pretty much all I got to say. I don't think I have any more slides. So thank you very much for joining me. And at this time I will end our little recording. Um, oh. See you guys next time. And thank you for joining me on Evans Imagines. <laughs>